Hey you guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week we are talking about, now you're laughing at me. I wasn't laughing. You made me good. laugh. <laughs> I'm smiling at you. Well, this week we are talking about multi <laughs> Sorry, it's a mouthful. I can't say it. This week we are talking... <laughs> This week we are talking about multi-species rotational grazing for the small homestead. There we go. You that is a it. mouthful, but it's easier than it sounds. Yeah, yeah. The topic is a lot easier to understand than it is to say. <laughs> well, and this is something that we've done for a long time and studied a lot. Matter of fact, um, you know, besides gardening and a few chickens, we got our start scaling up homesteading, raising beef cows. Yeah. Uh, on on actually a little larger acreage and studying Joel Salatin and Greg Judy and a lot of the um, you know well known holistic grazers. Right. Um, but it's something we haven't talked a lot about here at Homesteading Family. Well, and one of the challenges with studying them, just as an introduction, then we'll get to the chit chat, chat is that they're working on really large scale. Yeah, they are, and, and Joel does a great job of breaking it down in his systems you can use from an acre to a thousand acres. Mm. Um, but a lot of times the way the information is presented, it's, it's, it's hard to distill it down for the small homestead. What if you're on an acre? What if you're on three acres, you know, or ten? How can you raise a lot of meat, a lot of animals, and do it, you know, resiliently, sustainably, you know, while improving your pastures? Um, that's, I think that's been a challenge to distill and, and talk about. And yeah. so we, we want to enter into that a little bit and talk about what that is. And, and um, I don't know how far we'll get today, um, but maybe this will be an ongoing conversation. Yeah. And we'll see if it's, it's something that interests you guys. All right. Sounds good. But before we get into that, we need some chit chat. If you are new to the pantry chat, um, know that everything should be time stamped for you uh, so you can skip ahead if you are busy or you don't want to listen to chit chat or you want to just jump into the main topic you can skip ahead to the main topic but we like to do the chit chat yeah, just scroll down and the timestamp will be in the in the description feed there you go yeah. what have you been up to what have i been up to <laughs> well on topic. <laughs> uh, we're doing a lot outside. It's been a little slow to get started this year, but we're working on getting animals out. We've actually got the, the pigs, the Cooney Coonies, out on grass. They've been out on grass for a week or two now. Oh, good. And we've got some of our laying hens mm -hmm. out on grass, and we're just ready to start in with our rotational grazing. We've got sheep. Sheep shares coming actually today. Mm -hmm. After they're shorn, we can get them out and them and the, the uh, chickens into rotation. And so actually just getting our fences set up and getting a plan going for this year's grazing. And we're, well, we're on 40 acres right now. We're rotationally grazing a little over three. It's pro probably about four acres. And, and then we have some other ground that's just being lightly used by the beef cows. So it's, it really is that small homestead and it's amazing what you can accomplish. Our whole like productive area, like super productive area of the homestead is what, only five it's acres? Under, it's under five acres. acres, it's under five acres. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that includes two houses, a um, couple ponds, pasture and gardens and, and orchards and other infrastructure barn and whatnot. But that's on five acres and we produce, mm -hmm. you know, 90% you know, 80, 90 percent of what we do on that five acres for, you know, 15 to 20 people. Yeah. So you can do a lot in a small space. Yeah. And I think this is a major part of it is the rotational grazing. But we're not talking about that yet. We're talking about what you're doing. So good. Well, <laughs> that is what I'm doing. Um, you know, so we're getting that set up. We actually have some other land that we're going to get ready to clear that's in really degraded forest. It's been logged, unkept, and it needs to go to pasture. So. Uh, we're starting some work on that. I'm actually just feeding cows, beef cows up there right now. There's some roads, some very compact stuff. Mm -hmm. So instead of turning that up, I'm rolling out grass and, and um, feeding them on that to build up organic matter and fertilizer via, uh, you know, um, waste from the cows. Yeah, this so, is exciting because we're letting the cows do the work, right? The cow, Instead yep. of bringing in machinery and ripping up the land, mm -hmm. we're letting the cows actually come in and do that in a much more gentle way. Right, where we can. And we're going to have to bring in, in some light machinery to remove trees. But even that, we're going to do that without turning the ground over mm -hmm. and leaving the structure in place. Um, and so, 
Man, working on that, we've got um, gardens going outside. Yeah. We got an orchard in, we plant, we already had fruit trees. I don't know, we had a dozen fruit trees or so, but they were kind of random around the property. Mm -hmm. And so we, we picked an area between the house and the main crop garden and put in 19 trees Yay. recently. So that's exciting, a lot happening this year. Yeah. 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 And today, tomorrow, in the next couple of days, we have the first round of meat chicks coming in. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And turkeys. Yeah. So that's exciting. Yep. We're actually doing two rounds this year because as some of you guys know, uh, we have a son who has started raising and selling pastured chickens and turkeys. And that's really exciting. So really is. It's fun to see him picking up the vision. It's not really been our goal to farm ourselves, but to set it up for the next generation. And, and he's stepping into that. This is his third year. He's been working his way up slowly, but he's doing 200, 200 um, meat, well, 200 broilers, chicken broilers, and I don't know how many turkeys, yeah. a, a dozen, was... dozen or so. I think it's more than that. I Is think it? it's more like 25. Oh, wow. Yeah, so yeah. we've got a lot of a lot of them coming. So yeah. if you live in the area and you're interested in really well-raised pastured turkeys and chickens, send, send us, us an, an email. email. <laughs> but we can't ship, so don't send us an email asking if we can ship. No. Uh, we're not doing that, and we're not anywhere close to, to doing that. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, what about you? What are you Ooh. up to in this busy May season? May for us is the <laughs> kicker of the year, though we have a lot more hands this year, so yeah, it's, it's really do. nice. Every year as the kids get older, Older, they're much more helpful. <laughs> it's wonderful. And then they get really helpful and then they leave or get a full-time well, job and they can't be as helpful anymore. They do. We're also bringing interns in. We actually have yeah. two interns here. Right. And, and we'll just put that out there. One, it's a huge help to us. We need it. And But next year we'll be looking for more interns. So yeah. those of you that are interested, just keep your eye out for that. Yeah, absolutely. So that's been a big help it having, really has. having yeah. the extra sets of hands. But um, you know, right now we are getting everything in today. We're actually putting in tomatoes and peppers mm -hmm. and cucumbers. Those are all going in the hoop house. And then the uh, the storage crops of carrots and um, beets. beets are going in today. Okay. And so trying to get it all in. We have a break in the weather right now. We're having a couple of cool, mellow, cloudy days. So it's Good for the people who have to work in the garden, <laughs> but it's also really good for the plants, especially when we're not, transplanting. Not too much heat right away. Yeah, so we're getting all of those things in right now. Out in the cottage garden, the cottage garden looks amazing, and we have had so much success in the terrace garden mm -hmm. so far, which is kind of an extension of the cottage garden right out of the kitchen. Um, because we got things planted so early, we really utilize cold frames and hoop little low tunnels. Yep. Um, and so now we're just trying to keep that going. So all it's those things good. are it's, just yeah, moving along. The terrace gardens are expanding. Yes. And, and we've had uh, earlier greens this year than most years. I just won my first major battle in the war against grass in my cottage garden beds, <laughs> which I'm very excited about because this is a yearly battle, trying to keep the grass out of the beds in the cottage garden. Mm -hmm. And so we actually put in eight inch steel edging. <laughs> this is a wall trying to protect a little bit. We have some of the creeping grasses. I don't even know what they're called, what the specific names I, it's are. A, it's a, yeah, it's a native. I don't know what it is. Yeah. But, but, uh, and it, that's in an area that we had cleared and, and, and layer mulched and everything. And so the problem is mostly, and we had a few spots where it came through, but mostly from the edges that, you yeah, know, it's if, coming if you've in. got one of those grasses, <laughs> the roots are gonna come through unless you put up a barrier. So everything we do, we try to create systems that make it easier to continue doing what we're doing mm -hmm. the next year. And I just really felt like we weren't holding true to our values out in the cottage garden with that grass. And so, you know, this is the first step yeah. to making that easier. So I'm really excited about that. I think that's a, a good step forward. But boy, have we got beautiful flowers up all over the place. We've got um, all of our herbs coming up in the cottage garden. It's uh, perennial vegetables, the sorrel, the Good King Henry, and the Caucasian mountain spinach are all looking really, mm. really good out there. So I've been up to a lot of that. Yep, you yeah. sure have. Yeah. <laughs> Busy season, good stuff happening. Okay, you want to get into a question of the day? Sure. All right, this is from Teresa Hansel on the home dairy products versus store-bought. 
She asks, what kind of cows do you have, both for milking and beef? And do you milk morning and night or just once? And why did you choose the milk cow you did? Wow, well, there's a, there's a lot there. Uh, let's, let's answer the first part, which is what kind of cows for milk and beef. And so for the beef cows, we have Herefords. Um, love them. They're, they're uh, older generation Herefords, so they're a little smaller than what you might mostly see for Herefords today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they, they flesh better on grass. That means they, they meet out, they, they, they come to maturity better just on grass. And they're also just very mellow. So, 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 so we've mellow. loved them. There are lots of good breeds out there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we'll stick with pure Herefords because they're hard to find the ones that we want actually. And so we may go to a little more local, but definitely gonna work towards that, that smaller size, that heritage frame. And yeah, mm -hmm. they've been great for us. So that, that's what we have for beef cows. And then the dairy cow, she is a Jersey with a little bit of Frisian mm -hmm. in her and what I call a, a black Jersey. And we've had two of these, and we love them. Yeah, they have been great milk cows. They uh, give a ton of cream. They're very easy to work with. They have a better tendency to take with AI if you don't have Our, a Ours pole. have. Yeah, ours I have. don't have any. That's only anecdotal, but yeah. yeah. Right, because um, jerseys are kind of known to be really hard to AI and mm -hmm. not always take. And so we've had a lot of success with these. Um, and they give us a lot of cream. Yeah. So we like that. And they've, they've been good keepers. They're a little larger. So for some holdings, they're a little bit big. They're, they're on the larger side for a jersey. Mm -hmm. They're not like a Swiss uh, cow, Swiss dairy cow, but they are a little bit bigger. So if you have a small holding, you know, that might be a little bit large for you, but they've been very good, very good animals. She gives a lot of milk. Uh, both of them have. They've given about eight gallons a day at, at, at max. At, yeah, at, at max, max on in a grass. Year. Yeah, um, and so and it's it's like Carolyn said though it's creamy. it is creamy <laughs> eight gallons. So for our household, that's really really good. Yeah, and as far as milking morning or night, we're we're kind of all over the place. We kind of work it season seasonally, and so we start out milking twice a day. Um, Part of that's because this particular cow hasn't shared her calf very well, and you know we might ease into hasn't it. Hasn't shared bit her slower. milk with a calf very well. Uh, well, or with us when she has the calf. <laughs> right, exactly. And she's like a great cow if the calf's not around. But I think she's also such a great mama that she holds back her milk. She's real restless in the stanchion if she knows that calf's around. The calf goes bye bye. She's wonderful yeah so so anyway so we usually are removing the calf quickly milking twice a day for what the first five months or so five to six months depending on the season and then and as it gets towards fall we go down to once a day milking lighten it up a little bit and then we dry her off right about three months before she's due again there is a place in the season where all of a sudden butter does not uh, turn in cream doesn't turn into butter not as well it's not very, as very, well it yeah. takes a very long time there's actually all sorts of science behind that that i have just found i couldn't recite it to you yet but um but there's this place where it just stops turning and so um so at that point we kind of figure oh we've had enough in storage usually the cheese cave is full by then and we're just getting kind of drinking milk for the family and we just don't need that many gallons every day <laughs> to, to do twice a day milking. Yeah. Yep. So, so Good. that is it. That's, that's our dairy cow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she's nice. Her name's Tilly. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're jumping multi -species in. Multi-species rotational grazing for the small homestead. That's a mouthful. Can I just call it rotational grazing? Yes. What do okay. you want to know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why? We, like, what's it all about? Because I know this is something that people are hearing about, and sure. they see reference places. But, like, how is this different than just throwing your animals out in a pasture? Right. Okay. So let's unpack that a little bit. Rotational grazing. We'll go. We'll go to there first. Right. That is just moving the animals around. So in nature, when there were no fences, mm -hmm. what did grazing animals, ruminant type animals do? They moved around the landscape, finding the highest quality feed. So they, they moved a lot. They had room to move and they didn't stay in one area and eat all, eat all the grass or the forage down low and then move on. 
forage, the, the best quality in, in most of the season is at the top, top mm -hmm. few inches. It's where the best nutrition is, it's where the best taste is, those things go together. So animals would move across the landscape to find the best feed. And that had a lot of other benefits to it and it had benefits to the environment yeah. um, in, not, in not destroying a certain area and, and moving the parasites around, they didn't build up in an area. Um, also protect them from predators, you know, a lot of different things there, but, but they kept that feed well and it managed the land well. Mm. Well, then we start putting fences in and leaving animals in fixed areas. And what starts to happen is that the animals know, I mean, they know what they like, but what they like is what's best for them. And so they're going to take that first and then they're going to come back to the next best thing. And what eventually starts to happen is they keep coming back to the next best things mm. over and over and they eat those down and they ignore some of the other species that maybe are valuable, mm -hmm. but they're not as valuable, they're not as tasty. And they start to degrade the land and they take it down to the point that they will destroy the best quality pasture and forage in that pasture. And um, you'll end up with a degraded pasture of mostly annuals and lower quality. And, and eventually you've got water runoff issues and all kinds of different degradation. Mm -hmm. So rotational grazing is seeking to mimic that pattern within our fixed boundaries. We've got a piece of land, whether you've got an acre or a hundred acres or a thousand acres, we're trying to control move those animals since they don't have free range. They can't just pick whatever they want on the open range. Mm -hmm. So we have to help them out by keeping them in a smaller area, giving them the right amount of feed, allowing them to manure it and fertilize it, and then moving them on through that space. And so we're rotating them through the land in a way that feeds them well and actually builds the land instead of degrading it. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense, just thinking about how animals' behavior is mm -hmm. public, like in nature, right? Mm -hmm. um, how small can this apply to? Like, can can does this apply to somebody in a backyard with a couple of chickens for just the rotational grazing part? Just the rotational grazing part without the multi-species, yes, so you could absolutely. Just, like, give your and chickens a few square feet and move them around. Well, sure. Instead of having them, because chickens do the same thing, and we were just watching this. We're getting our, our layers out early. We're mm -hmm. getting them on pasture, and they had a fairly big area in the chick shaw where they're moving. Yeah. But what would they do? They leaving them in there for a couple of days. They had their spots they wanted to go back, and right away they were tearing holes into the grass and creating mm -hmm. dust baths. And they've got this giant area. They're not harming the forage at all, but for the chickens they're creating this impact that's not good. Mm -hmm. And it takes them a couple days to do that. One day, two days, they don't do too much. Right. But you leave them sitting there, they do. So even in a backyard, you can contain your chickens either in a netting or, or a chicken tractor, those mm -hmm. of you that are familiar with that. And you can move them from spot to spot. Yes, you have to move them every day, but you're giving them new feed, they're fertilizing, and they're moving around. And there's no reason you can't do that in a, in a backyard. Absolutely. And my next thought is, well, you know, depending on the size of your backyard, do you want to run rabbits in there? And th this is theory. I, you know, I haven't done this or, or even seen this on the small holding, but I think you could even get to the multi-species part. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason. You couldn't do chickens. You couldn't do ducks. You couldn't do geese. You couldn't do rabbits. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the ones that come to mind in a pretty small yard. Okay. So, you know? so as far as rotational grazing goes, this is something that you can do kind of whether it's really small or really big land. So this is, can apply and get, have benefits for people at all different levels. Right, and let's talk about it just for a second on the other side. On larger land, could you do it with single species? Like we're talking mm -hmm. about here, just chickens or just ducks. Could you do it? Yes, you definitely can. Okay. The same principles, you're moving them around through nature, getting them the best feeds, fertilizing and letting that land rest is the term that we have and let it regrow. And often, managed well, you can come back, depending on your environment and a lot of other things, you can come back and regraze that at a time, maybe two. People like Joel Salatin, they can come back over there on six times in a season. Mm. Um, but he's developed that over years and his climate plays into that. But that becomes very powerful, even with a single species. Okay, so now let's talk about adding that layer in of the multi-species. Right. And what is that, why would you do that? Well again, we're looking to nature, we're looking to creation for the answers, right? There are no monocultures in nature. God didn't create monocultures. There are always inner working species and systems. Mm -hmm. And that aligns with what we're trying to do as homesteaders and stewards of the land. One, we wanna take good care of the land. Two, we need to produce for ourselves and create our own resiliency in our food systems as much as we can on the land that we have, mm -hmm. right? Well, nature allows that and you can start combining species 
to create benefits and run multiple types of animals. And a real common one that people talk a lot about is the ruminant, like the cow and the chickens, right? Mm -hmm. That's a ruminant and a bird. And in nature, you would see, say, in American context, buffalo and birds following the buffalo. Right. And the birds help with parasites. Uh, the manure created certain bugs that the birds would eat. And there's, there's a whole symbiotic relationship there. And so we're mimicking that. We're not necessarily accomplishing everything that was happening in that broad natural system. But we can take a cow, lead, lead the cow ahead in the feed, say a dairy cow. It's a great combination for a small homestead. And put a dairy cow in. She's in front. And behind, a couple days, the chickens are coming. Your mm. meat chickens or your egg layers. And what's happening? Well, the chickens are coming behind. Uh, often that manure has gotten fly larvae or something in it. You're feeding the chickens. They're spreading the fertilizer, right? The cow patty's out. They're spreading it out so it's not clumped because mm -hmm. when it clumps, you get high nutrient density and the cows actually won't come back to that for sometimes a year or more. Um, when you bring them back in. And so the chickens are spreading that out and evening the fertilizer in mm -hmm. your system. And now you're raising two sets of animals and products on the same ground done correctly. So it's beneficial to both because you're spreading that out so the grass is getting better for the cows mm -hmm. for the next time they come through. You're, the chickens are eating off the fly the, manure. The fly, or, other parasites. The fly larva, mm -hmm. or anything else that's yep. in that poop. Um, and they're fertilizing the chickens. Call it manure. That sounds better. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> manure instead of poop. <laughs> oh, got it. Manure. Okay. Manure it is. Um, I like fertilizer. Let's call it fertilizer that's because that's better. what it is, and that's one of the huge benefits when you realize that it's fertilizer. We all, yeah. you know, we're in our industrial mindset. We've got to fertilize our gardens. We got to fertilize our lawns. We got to fertilize our pastures. Nature was made to do all of that. It's mm -hmm. the animals. We're actually controlling the distribution of fertilizer, which is increasing the quality of the feed, which allows us to better feed our animals yeah. and have a better quality feed for ourselves. So, so you start to get this system going that's really working together. And guys like Joel Salatin will run the chickens, even though he's running a large business, he'll run the chickens just to fertilize the grass to feed the cows let alone that he then gets to sell the eggs or, or the uh, meat, but there's a lot of economic proof that just that fertilization and doing that labor provides enough benefit to make it worthwhile. So I think this is such an important principle here on this because you know, when we look at a pasture, we kind of naturally think, what can it do for us, right? Like we can feed some animals on there and get mm -hmm. some meat out of it, or maybe some eggs out of the chickens. But we always want to be in this situation where we're thinking about how we can improve what's around us. How can we improve the land? How can we improve our soil? How mm -hmm. we, can we improve the grass? Um, we want to be a net benefit when we show up somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Not a drain. <laughs> like humanity is so often a drain on the environment. That, that's our us. tendency, right? And so we want to show up. And this is one of the things that you can really do to benefit the land in a lot of ways. Because you are making that pasture better, not only for the animals you're running, but for every species that accesses those pastures. So you get a better return on it. Your animals are healthier. They're happier. They're living a more natural life. Mm -hmm. They're more naturally resistant to disease and things that mm -hmm. comes through because they're constantly moving on to fresh pasture. They're not having the same type of, um, of, of parasite issues. And so that just puts them in an altogether healthier state between the nutrition and not being weak from parasites. Right. And so you're just improving the entire state of the land around you and its productivity and the health of everything when you start increasing your pasture. And you can do this directly with the animals if you're doing it correctly, which is so exciting. Right, and it, it's important to note that doing it correctly. So the common thing is to take animals and just put them out on a piece of land mm -hmm. and that land degrades. And humanity has been doing this. It's not just us and American homesteaders that might have that tendency. Humanity has been doing this for years and desertification is a real thing. Civilizations have desertified an area by just putting the animals on it and overusing it people are doing that on a small scale as well. And it doesn't have to be that way. It just has to be managed correctly. Mm -hmm. And it does take some work. It does take some involvement. Right. But 
when you get systems up, like you were talking about earlier, and you have systems to do this and you pay attention, it's not that much work, especially for the reward, for the fruit of your labor, not just in this year, but you're building resiliency, having done it right into the landscape, mm -hmm. and you're creating surplus. And you know, you just made me think of the, the core principles that I, I, I look to guide our systems and what we do, and that's core permaculture principles, which are caring for people, caring for the earth, the land, and creating a surplus. Mm -hmm. And and nature is made in such a way that we can do all of those at the same time. Yeah. We can feed ourselves, we can improve the quality of the land while we're doing that and have enough surplus to say, you know, improve the land with, with the fertilizer that we're creating and enough food to share or sell with others. Mm. And, and so there's that abundance and that can grow as we get better and better at this. Wow. That's exciting. So it really it's is. Exci it's not, you know, modern ec economics, I guess I want to say, kind of says either you have or I have, right? Mm -hmm. you, you take something away and so therefore the other person doesn't have. Right. You take something out of the pasture so the pasture is degrading, right? Well, it is. And that, then we look at it. That's kind of modern conventional mm -hmm. agriculture. And then you look at this and you're like, no, I can add. I mean, this is like God's economy, isn't it? Oh, like, it totally You know, is. the more I give, the more I get back sort of a thing. Yeah. And that's what happens here. The more you put into it, the more energy, the more focus, the more animals and movement and things like that, the more you end up getting back if done correctly. <laughs> I, I think it's a beautiful imagery of God's gracefulness to us expressed in nature yeah. that even though there's all these challenges in nature and it's easy to degrade, if we'll work with the principles mm -hmm. and the way things work, that's why we talk about looking at nature. We're not trying to do exactly what nature's doing. We're trying to look at how does nature work? How can we put this into then a controlled situation and, and apply those principles in a way that, that does everything you're talking about? And that, that's just, to me, it's exciting and it's, it's God's grace to us through through nature. No, I think all of these things are so neat in theory, but what I really think of is neat is seeing it play out in our own pasture. Mm -hmm. Because we've been kind of on a journey when we got to this property, um, it was very degraded. The pasture was... Degraded, sprayed, trampled on, mm -hmm. fertilized, chemicalized. <laughs> it was everything. It was not in good shape. Yeah. It was pitted all over with holes. Mm. It, it was rough. And here we are, and we've got sheep going out, pigs going out, chickens going out, uh, cows going out, you know, all coming through this space. And it is amazing to see it just get more and more lush um, as we do that, which is really kind of neat. Well, an example of that real quick is that when the first year we got here, we put out four sheep. Yeah. Uncontrolled because it looked like it had. We were busy. We we're getting settled. We we're doing all kinds of things. And I said, "Oh, that 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 several acres can handle four sheep for a couple months." You know, I didn't have time to rotate. I knew better, and the four sheep tore up the land. Hmm. You know, and but and so the land couldn't support them. Come now, we're in our fifth season, and that same ground is supporting, like you said, a dairy cow, probably I don't know eight sheep this year. Um, 70 laying hens, it's, we're going to run over 400 chickens through it and some pigs as well. And, and that's just in a few years, the increase of that same plot of ground from applying these principles. And that's only after a few years of applying the principles. So it's like we're seeing it get almost exponentially better yeah. year after year, which is really exciting because it's like, gosh, 10 years from now. So it's, to me, it's really exciting to say we inherited, we bought this piece of land that couldn't even keep a couple sheep alive for a few months. Um, and what we're going to pass on to our children or, you know, the next buyers of the property, whatever it is, is our children. something, our children, <laughs> is something that is robust and resilient and can support a lot of life. And that to me is just speaks well of, you know, good uh, taking care of what we have, which is important to do. Absolutely. So you guys, this is something that if you are grazing any sort of animal or you're interested in grazing any sort of animal, if you have some land, it's something that we really want to encourage you to look at, to consider and to dive into how you might start rotational grazing and adding extra species in to help each other be kind of the symbiotic relationship there 
to uh, speed up healing the land, but also mm -hmm. keeping it really fertile. Yeah, and, and we're going to bring more of this to the table, I think, yeah. this summer. And let us know if this is a subject you're excited about. We can talk about it here more. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can also get out into the pasture and do a few things, as well as some, some other educational material coming this way. Definitely let us know. Leave a comment below. And if there's other things you want to hear about in the pantry mm -hmm. chats, please let us know. That always helps us to know what you're thinking about and what we can help with. That's why we're here. <laughs> All right, you guys, it's been great hanging out with you. See you soon. Goodbye. Bye.